a fight. I couldn't even knock on the door without drawing the attention of a squad car across the street. The home has been under 24-hour police guard since Garner's death. The cop keeping watch. NYPD Bruce, it didn't actually start as a project necessarily. Um, I was sitting at my desk, saw the, the online video of the death of Eric Garner. I remember sort of feeling like, how can this happen and how can I actually be watching this? And I started asking, well, at least what to me were like very just basic questions. This guy was supposedly selling loose cigarettes. Like, is it normal for arrests to turn violent when someone is a accused of something really minor? Like, is it normal for the cops to to, to sort of uh, resort to force uh, in, in cases like this? And then I tried to figure out, well, you know, sur- surely there must be a report that says that. And so I, I said, okay, well, where's this, you know, where's the use of force report? Um, and there wasn't one. I, I couldn't find one. My role in a lot of this is is diving very deep into the data side of things. Um, you, you get a lot of anecdotal stuff. You can hear stories from particular people that have had interactions with police. Um, but to actually know how widespread a problem is, uh, what the scale of things are, we got to get hard numbers. Um, so one place we do that is uh, state court records. Um, and so resisting arrest shows up as a potential red flag. If an officer is charging people with res- resisting arrest all the time, it indicates that officer, um, that it indicates that things are escalating in a particular way. And the first piece, I mean, it was a pretty basic piece, I think, that I did maybe a week, two weeks after the death of Eric Garner with just a very simple thesis, which was, you know, as shocking as this was, it's not uncommon for low-level arrests to spiral dangerously out of control. Um, And this is a big deal in a city that has prioritized low-level arrests. So you've got cops out there aggressively uh, approaching the, the enforcement of these sort of minor uh, laws or and, and looking for these sort of minor crimes, violations, sometimes not even criminal law. The danger is is that you're going to have more garners where, um, you know, disproportionate amount of force is being used or what would appear to be a disproportionate amount of force is being used um, in the enforcement of what seem like rather minor uh, uh, offenses or minor laws. This past summer, we spent a lot of time going around uh, through all 50 states Uh, to look at the state of things like public records law uh, as it relates to police officers. New York has a very restrictive law that makes it very hard to get information about a police officer's disciplinary history or history of complaints. Uh, If an officer has a history of, say, using force and getting uh, disciplined for it by the department, you you can't find that out as a citizen. Um, But that's not true everywhere. If you go to a state like Florida, it's very easy to find that out. Uh, And there's a very wide spectrum of how different departments and how different states uh, treat this in the, in the trade-off between officer privacy and the public's right to know. A lot of people will report this from a thousand feet. You don't want to name names or you don't want anyone to be the, the poster boy for something. Um, and, and I think that um, sometimes actually calling out individual cases, individual uh, officers, if that's the case may be, um, can be more powerful. If this guy with this record can still be on the street, is that okay? And, and I'm not saying, I don't know that I made a full value judgment on that, but I think the public has a right to question if that's okay.